Now I'm going to warn you. This will be tough for some of you to hear. I genuinely just gave myself goosebumps thinking about this encounter. This is the story of where my mother and I came ridiculously close to a brutal end. I'm going to choose to be less explicit in what was actually said. At this point I was 15 and had just got done with the summer of being homeless and had moved into a shady little apartment with my aunt in the heart of York City, Pennsylvania. My mother was still with the man who had beaten me badly and had caused us to be homeless. They had broken up but that wouldn't last even two weeks. But anyway, my mother had actually come down to York City to spend the weekend with me because they were temporarily broken up so she didn't need his permission. It was bike night on a Friday or Saturday night and my mother and I both have a love for Harleys. She had dated a lot of bikers over the years so even I had an ample experience on a bike by that point. But we had walked from my aunt's apartment to where the bike night was being held to get out and have some fun. My mother and I get lots of attention from the rowdy bikers and the like, but we had no trouble overall and had a great time. For a moment, it had felt like old times with her, when I could have called her my closest friend. We probably began heading home a little after 10, and it was going to take close to a half an hour walk to get back to my aunt's place. York City wasn't very safe to walk during the day, much less at night. We avoided the streets with royal names like King and Queen. If you were on those roads at night, you were liable to get shot. But our precautions were not enough. We had made it maybe half a mile up the road from the event. If you look behind you, you could still see the lights in the tents, even lightly hear the music still going on. We were quietly talking when, from a dark alleyway, a man stepped out. He was maybe 5'8", thin but muscular. Hispanic and covered in tattoos with a bandana on his head to tie it all together. Look at you lovely ladies, he said as he steps out of the dark. I was a little buzzed, as was my mother, so despite all I'd been through, I had been mildly amused, probably because I found it funny he was hitting on my mother and I at the same time. But before either of us could respond, another three men came out of the alleyway, and when I turned around, there was another two men behind us. The leader who had originally stepped out pulled out a blade and took a step closer. You know, I've never been with a mother and a daughter before. To which he smiled wickedly. I stiffened as he stood inches in front of me and took the hand without the blade and stroked my hair, then roughly grabbed a fistful of it and bent my head back as he licked up my neck. This is what you two are, isn't it? My mother remained silent, as did I. I could feel the blade then pressed against my breast, and he laughed as I let out a choked noise of terror. I quickly nod, then looking straight ahead but through him like he wasn't there. Silent tears streamed down my face. He wraps his arm around me and whispers, Being brave won't save you, girl. And he takes a step back, pointing the knife inches from my face as he says, Get on your knees. You're going to be both me and my boy's toys for the night, if you know what's good for you. I didn't move, just continued to silently cry, oblivious to the world around me. My mind was genuinely not processing the situation or what was about to happen. I look over at my mom and she's crying too, and she grabs my hand. I can see another man fondling her, also holding a knife. You two better listen. You two wanted this. You wouldn't be out here looking like this if you didn't want this to happen. Save the tears, you'll need them. And who knows, if you behave, you might even like it. And with that, he slaps me across the face with the back of his hand, and I crumple to the ground as my mom begins slowly lowering herself to her knees with her hands up in the air. It's then that from behind me I hear a loud smash and swearing. The rest goes in slow motion. I look up to see a group of bikers, at least 15 of them. The smashing noise I had heard was one of them smashing a bottle against the man's head who was standing behind me. The biker quickly overtakes the six men and are genuinely beating them worse than anything I've ever seen. 
like taking their bodies and slamming their heads into the brick wall repeatedly and stopping on them unhesitantly. I'm swiftly dragged to the side and a biker with a long grey beard and wearing glasses, even though it's night, asks me if I'm okay. In the madness, I had lost sight of my mom and I say no, sobbing like a child, and he points to my right where she had been pulled out no more than ten feet from me. A female biker is talking to her. I let out a gasp of relief and the man quickly asks me if I can walk. I nod, unable to make words, and he quickly picks me up to my feet and grabs me by the shoulders. Listen to me. You need to get out of here. Just run home and don't turn around no matter what. I can't stop crying, but I actually quickly grab the man and hug him, whispering a thank you that I'm not even sure he heard. Go. You're okay now. And I nod and stumble over to my mother. I take one last glance at the fight and at this point all I can see is the group of bikers standing around in a circle. My mom is crying the worst I've ever seen her and we just run. We make it another 200 feet when the gunshots ring out. I freeze and turn but my mom pulls on me and just shakes her head. It's only another minute when two cop cars go whizzing by us with their lights on. I don't remember the rest of the trip home at all. We were just suddenly there and I couldn't cry anymore. My mom and I didn't say a word about it, never even talked about it again. We both got violently drunk that night. My aunt stayed upstairs, probably high as a kite anyways. I lay in the shower with a bottle of vodka in my hand. I was covered in bruises had bits of glass in my hair and some that had cut my face, neck, and hands from the bottle being smashed so close behind me. But otherwise, I was physically okay. To think what could have happened made me even sicker. I haven't even had my first kiss yet, and the thought of what was about to happen, of the fact that I was going to die that night, left me numb. I genuinely owe my life to a group of bikers who I will never be able to thank. I hope none of them got into trouble, though in my heart I believe they ended up ending the lives of six of those men who had surrounded us that night. Obviously, with having just been homeless, I still didn't have a cell phone. We had no cable or any computer in the apartment, so I was never able to confirm what happened. It's only with typing this now that I consider for the first time looking it up to see if I could find anything on it, but I don't want to be reminded. I don't ever want to see the gang's face again, even if they're dead. And I definitely don't want to see the biker gang who saved my mother and I, as there might have been serious negative repercussions for doing so. So to the biker gang who saved our lives, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And to everyone else out there, please stay safe. This happened when I was 11 years old. I know it was right around then because I was with my little brother in the $2 theater seeing the new Avatar movie that had come out just a few months earlier in 2010. It was in the middle of this little shopping area surrounded by stores. My mom had dropped me off with my little brother, Jay, who had only just turned four at the time. I think my twin, Cass, had gone to a friend's birthday party sleepover, which is why I was allowed to take Jay. My mother was supposed to only be in one of the stores immediately around the little theater, but evidently she didn't anticipate how long the movie was going to be, and I definitely didn't have a phone back then, so she had no way of contacting me or I her. Anyway, I leave the theater carrying Jay, though he could walk if he wanted to. The $2 theater was never super busy, so there was only another six people or so who were leaving the theater the same time as us. As soon as we stepped out of the theater, I noticed my mother's falling apart red minivan was nowhere in sight. This immediately made me uncomfortable, but I wasn't super surprised. At first, we sat on a bench right outside the theater, waiting, while Jay kept talking about how cool the blue people were with their flying dinosaurs and how he wanted one. But after over half an hour of waiting, a worried employee came out and asked if we were okay and if we needed her to call someone. My mother didn't have a cell phone either, so that was unhelpful, but I knew better than to act like I needed help. 
I shoot Jay a look to keep quiet and he obeys. If she called the police, my mother would be livid. She always told us that if we thought growing up with her was bad, wait until we were put into foster care and split apart, or she'd just say if we ever left her, she'd end her own life, which I fully believe, so I just smiled politely and told the woman that our mom would be there any minute to pick us up. I knew we couldn't just stay and sit there now, so I told Jay we needed to start walking home, which looking back wasn't my best idea. The theater was almost half an hour's drive from my house. It would take me well past dark to get home by myself, and even longer still having to carry my chunky four-year-old, especially with how small I was for my age. But I had Jay to look after, and I was super protective of him, so I was on high alert as soon as we began walking. We crossed the street on the crosswalk and began making the long trip towards our house down the sidewalk, with Jay on the inner side of me, so if anything happened, he wouldn't be hit by a car. He waddled alongside me for a while, but we didn't even make it completely out of eyesight of the shopping center when a small black car pulled over, and a middle-aged man with thinning hair and dark eyes smiled and waved at me like he knew me. Hello there, he replies cheerfully, and I back up, still ridiculously shy, and mumbled a polite hi back. What is a precious young lady like you doing out here? Is that your son? Now keep in mind, I'm like 11 years old and looked even younger than that. I was still completely a skinny child in appearance and definitely did not look old enough to be Jay's mother by any stretch of the imagination. I laughed awkwardly. <laughs> no, this is my little brother. We're just headed home, thank you. And with that, I pick up Jay, who had taken to hiding behind me and began walking again. But he didn't drive off. He slowly continues to pull up next to me, following my pace. Come on, let me give you a ride. It's too hot here for you to be walking with your brother. We can stop for ice cream too to cool you down. My treat. He smiles again widely and I just shake my head. I can't. My mom will probably pick us up on the way. She should be here any minute, really. But thank you again. I was trying to be polite as possible to get him to go away, but he continued to creep by, though I still didn't see him as a threat at all, just a nuisance. I suddenly look around and can't help but notice how unpopulated the area is. Oh, your mom? I know her. She's actually the one who called me and told me to pick you two up and take you home. And with that, my fear finally kicked in. My mother was the epitome of irresponsible, but she would never send a stranger to pick us up like this. Jay remained uncharacteristically quiet, turning his head away from the man and beginning to cry, tugging on my sleeve without saying anything. And I don't know why I decided to say something so stupid, but I did. Listen, mister, you already asked if my brother was my son, so you obviously don't know my mom. Please leave us alone, we're fine. And that's when the huge smile instantly disappears from his face. Get in the car, he says in a deadly serious tone, all joy gone. I instinctually take a step back. My mouth drops open but no words escape. Then he raises his voice. I said now, young lady, get in the car. And before I can even respond or decide what to do, there's a loud, blaring car horn that takes both of our attention. I never thought I'd be so excited to see my mom's ratty minivan. I had been so entranced in fear with this conversation that I hadn't even noticed my mother pull up behind him, still blaring her horn. She looks so angry. I stick up my middle finger to the guy and run to my mom's car. She stops blaring the horn in time for me to hear tires squeal as he hits the gas and drives away like an insane man. I turn to Jay and he's followed my lead, flipping off the man as he drives away. I begin to cry and smile at Jay, giving him a high five for being so brave. I shakily walk into my mom's van and buckle Jay into his seat, feeling like I'm about to vomit as the adrenaline finally takes control. My mother yells at me the entire way home, telling me how stupid I was to try to walk home and that I should have just waited for her. 
I sob and ask where she was, and she says that the movie was so long she decided to drive down the street to go grocery shopping at Walmart. I try to explain what the man was saying, thinking it might have made her less mad at me, but she snubs it, telling me he was just a concerned adult who saw two kids on the side of the road and was trying to help. It wasn't until I was near 15 when the story got brought up again and my mom, who was drinking, immediately got a guilty smile on her face and actually admitted that she knew that I had been telling the truth, that the man had clearly been up to no good. She explained it's why she blasted the horn at him, so he wouldn't try to do anything, and that, given the way he flew out of there, is incriminating enough. She continued claiming that she didn't tell me because she didn't want me to grow up being overly paranoid and thinking I was all that, which is ironic giving all the situations and stories to come, so gee, thanks mom. Way to save the day and still manage to be a pretty crummy mother. Before I start, I want to clarify and explain a few things in case that changes anything or allows for anything to make more sense. First off, I would, at this point in my life, consider myself goth, and at the time I was just beginning to transition into that lifestyle. At this point in life, I'm used to the stares or comments, but at the time, as I had been dressing alternatively, but in a way that was more pulled back, I wasn't used to stares as often. The day this story took place, I had been wearing the generic goth platform buckle boots, which to the general public stands out a lot. Another thing I would consider important is that this specific mall and region of my state in general is known for human trafficking. The mall itself has a large arcade that's part of a large company, and so it has later closing times since it is independently run. I bring this up because there is an entrance from the mall, but... There is also a separate entrance from the parking lot for when the mall is closed. I was at this arcade with my sister and cousin, which isn't necessarily relevant aside from the fact that I'm older than them and felt like it was my responsibility to protect both of them as well as myself, and we were in the back by a cluster of Japanese claw machines. My cousin had been playing this game where you won the prize by rolling a mini version of the toy into a cup with a stupid claw that made the process long and daunting. She had been inching it along and my sister decided to get ice cream as my cousin had been playing for at least 10 minutes. The way the claw machines are set up, there are aisles created by the machines with one at the end of the aisle that kind of acts as a bookend. The machine my cousin was playing happened to be one of the end machines and I was watching her until I saw a man emerge out of the aisle next to us. He seemingly came out of nowhere and I was immediately unsettled by his demeanor. I am in no way saying this to be judgmental and I only mention it because I wanted to give the man the benefit of the doubt because he possibly came from a culture with different social rules. The man was either of Indian or Spanish descent and had the widest, emptiest eyes that I've ever seen in my life. I immediately felt threatened because I tend to be paranoid but I tried to brush it off as the man accidentally staring at me since I do look a bit odd. However, I couldn't shake my initial feeling of dread and stole glances at the man every once in a while. Eventually, I maintained eye contact with the man as his gaze never left me and he began to move closer to us. After about a minute of slow walking, we were less than a foot apart and I could feel him breathing as he walked around us tightly in a very territorial and intimidating way. I kept my eyes locked on him and pulled out my phone only breaking eye contact to pretend to dial a number and absent-mindedly telling my cousin that John probably wonders where we are, so I'm going to let him know we're at the arcade. Upon hearing the mention of a man's name, the man broke eye contact and quickly scurried away to the prize shop across the way from the machine. I desperately wanted to leave, though technically nothing had happened aside from my personal space being broken. Though, as I mentioned above, at that point, I had hoped that it was a cultural difference. My cousin was unnerved, but for whatever reason, she continued to play the game. I felt trapped because I didn't want to leave my cousin alone, but I felt the need to get my sister. I ended up staying with my cousin since I hadn't seen the man leave the store. Eventually, my cousin won the game and went to get an employee to retrieve the prize from the glass case. I was alone for a minute, but she came back 
telling me that someone would be there soon. Somewhere in between this, the man came out of the store, and I just wanted to get my sister as the ordeal had taken at least 20 minutes at this point. The man was inches away from us again and was doing the territorial stare as he circled us. I was so intimidated and I remember just standing there shaking as he wordlessly stared at us. I shakily told my cousin that I was going to get my sister and walk through her and the man, barely missing brushing up against him, and walked into the aisle of the claw machines he had originally come from. He quickly began to shuffle toward me and every ounce of courage left my body. Thinking on my feet, I mumbled a quick, never mind, and came back to my cousin. The next few minutes were agonizing as the man lingered around us. Though I was taller than him and really should have been the intimidating one, I felt so trapped and responsible for everyone around me. I didn't want to move to have him follow me, but I also just wanted my sister back so we could get out. As if it were a movie, the employee... A twenty-something man that was much less intimidating than I walked up to us to open the machine and give my cousin her prize. Immediately, the man walked down the aisle and I didn't see him again. I pushed back the urge to tell the employee the predicament. I stopped myself because I didn't want the man to blow me off and think that I was being silly. My sister ended up coming back and we quickly shuffled out. I ended up telling an employee that I had been chatting with at a store earlier and she said that we should tell security at the arcade. We went back and ultimately they blew me off and it really upset me because this place, despite having a bar and bowling alley, was full of kids and I felt genuinely concerned. As this comes to a close, I'd like to add that the reason I talked about the door at the beginning of this post is because the machine that we were at was relatively close to the door and we were alone so the man would have had an easy time dragging us to the parking lot entrance if he needed to. I ended up having a breakdown about it that night, even though nothing really happened. I just felt so inexplicably horrified and full of dread that I can't even begin to explain. So yesterday... I was walking back home after hanging out with some friends. Before anyone asks, I was completely sober and in my right mind. I've never been afraid to walk alone in the dark. I'm quite tall and intimidating looking from a distance and I always bring a pocket knife when I know I'll be walking in the dark. I was walking past some woods on the way back to my house and I heard my mother's voice call. Gabriel! Help! From inside the woods... I immediately recognized her voice and turned to look into the woods. She kept calling my name over and over. I couldn't see anything. It was far too dark to see through the trees. Mom? I called back, heading towards the woods. She sounded like she was in trouble and scared. I assumed that she had gone for a run like she did every night and somehow got lost in the woods. Then I realized it couldn't be her. She had texted me only ten minutes before asking me to come home soon to watch my little sister so she could go on a run. I stopped dead in my tracks and called my mom. The voice in the woods still calling my name and getting more frantic by the second. She picked up and I immediately asked her if she was in the woods. She said no. She was back home with my little sister. I swear to God, as soon as she had said she was back home, Her voice stopped calling my name from inside the woods. I was overcome with a wave of dread and fear that I had never felt before. Something in the woods was trying to lure me in using my mother's voice, and it knew my full name, not just my nickname, which made things even scarier because the only person who calls me Gabriel is my mom. I immediately turned and ran faster than I ever ran before back home. When I got back home, my legs felt like jello and my lungs burnt. I opened the door and there was my mom, sitting on the couch with my sister. I would think this was some sort of prank, but my mom isn't one for pranks and even if she was, there is no way she could have gotten home before me without me seeing her. This happened a year and a half ago. I'm a 31-year-old petite female at 5'2 who looks much younger. 
To set the backstory, I am a self-employed sub-postmaster of a post office. Here in Scotland, the post offices are privatized and separate from the Royal Mail Delivery Service, so this is my own business which I had taken over and subsequently relocated to my pre-existing shop. The reason for the move is another interesting story involving a year of lies, harassment, and vindictive ulterior motives which I will reserve for another time. I was over a year into running the post office when I was getting ready to head out of town for the weekend for the first time since taking over. Preparing my staff on the Wednesday night, I ran over a few safety procedures. I told her that it wouldn't happen, but if anybody came in threatening to rob the place, she was to let them have it. Put her own safety first. Money isn't worth your life, etc., etc. I told her about the panic buttons, but reiterated that as far as I was aware, nobody has attempted this in the 60-odd years that the post office has been located on my street, and it probably will never happen. The next day was my last day before going away. Another colleague that worked beside me had Thursdays off, so I was working alone. Everything going as normal. At one point, a young lad in shorts and t-shirts stuck his head in the door and asked if I had a cash machine. I informed him he could withdraw cash at the counter. He replied, Okay, I'll be in in a minute, I just need to grab my card. No red flags. This happened regularly. He might have left his wallet in his car or maybe he lives really close. Ten minutes later and after serving other customers, I was back alone when a figure came in wearing a tracksuit bottoms a pullover jacket with hood up and scarf pulled up over his face. As previously stated, a lad had come in with shorts and t-shirt. This outfit before me was abnormal for our warm end of summer weather. He asked if he could speak to a manager. I am the manager, I replied. What? Nobody's through the back? Nobody else I can speak to? Alright, here we go. The irony. I pulled the door behind me shut and stepped backwards. The lad said to not press any buttons as he scanned the room for a camera and simply said, I need money, as he shifted his jacket revealing a knife tucked in his waistband. It's funny how fight or flight overrules logic. I also now know that in a situation that results in the fight or flight response, my scrappy Scottish attitude overrules my aforementioned petite stature. I stepped forward towards the panic buttons but wanting to maintain the upper hand and keep them to my advantage, I said, in the most sincerely threatening, growling and menacing voice possible, First of all, I have panic buttons. Second of all, you better get out, right now. This startled him. He looked around, glanced out the window, and bolted. So much for, let them have the money, don't put yourself in danger, money isn't worth your life, spiel. I had recognized his build and voice as the shorts and t-shirt lad that had been in previously. As I had seen his face then, I was able to identify him from both a photo and video lineup. He was caught within hours and after a court appearance, all he gained for his attempted armed robbery was a bruised ego and a jail sentence. I worked at a small, old hospital for a couple of years. Four floors, only two floors being used, and a small ER. I was a med surge RN working 7pm to 7am. Med surge meant we had patients who had just had, or needed to have, surgery, and also patients who were just sick. Most of the patients were elderly and just sick with things like pneumonia, anemia, acute kidney failure, etc., etc., when older folks get sick, they tend to get confused and might do or say things that they normally wouldn't. But this, whatever this was, was not cool. This was mortifying and I'm the only one who heard it. We joke that because the hospital was so old that it was creepy and specifically on the right wing of our unit, and obviously at night, guess who got assigned the right wing that night? So I got bedtime meds ready for the old folks down there and started walking down the hall with my med cart and charts for each patient. I had received report from the previous day's RN that room 214 was a woman, we'll call her Kathy, who was only 55 and in for pneumonia, completely alert and oriented. I give the patients down there their meds one by one and, yeah, 
I'm tired and mildly annoyed that it takes room 216 over 10 minutes to swallow a plethora of pills, one by one, and then proceeded to pull out his IV that was delivering his antibiotics. But I digress. So needless to say, it took me a little longer to get to room 214. She didn't seem upset, just tired. I did my assessment and she was in fact oriented to day, time, name, and location. I say goodnight after hanging another bag of fluids. I'm hanging out in the hall with my computer documenting my assessments and I hear something that shook me. It sounded like whispering, but I heard more than one person doing it. I cocked my head up and hear better, I mean, it is night shift and I'm tired so I'm making sure I actually heard this. I follow the noise to the outside of Kathy's room and there seems to be a full-blown whispery conversation going on with multiple people. I couldn't make out what the different voices were saying, but it sounded like chanting of some sort. I had to make sure I was legitimately hearing these whispers that seemed like they were coming from different people, and try to make some sense of it. I walked slowly past her door, which was slightly cracked open. Hoping to hear things more clearly, the whisper chanting sound only got louder and were still unintelligible. Kathy, who had been tucked in bed and dozing off when I saw her less than seven minutes ago, was now sitting straight up on the side of her bed, looking away from me at the wall. Doesn't that sound pretty scary? Well, Kathy was unable to lift herself out of bed without assistance during my assessment. Kathy was having labored breathing when I assessed her. Now Kathy has pulled her nasal cannula out of her nose the plastic thing that goes around your face and has two spouts that go up your nose to give you extra oxygen, sat up in bed in less than seven minutes without struggle, and then she stood up, still looking away. She turned and walked to the bathroom, still without seeing me. Because she was labeled a fall risk, she shouldn't be out of bed alone. I saw her profile and her lips were not moving, but the whispers grew louder. I panicked, but kept my cool. I briskly walked to the nurse's station and asked if a nursing assistant could please help Kathy with the restroom. I normally would do it myself, but I was rather busy and Kathy was doing quite well on her own. I was sweating, freaking out and getting further behind on my charting. The nursing aide helping Kathy didn't report anything unusual when I asked how she was doing. I promise, I swear I heard those voices. They were loud they were unsettling to say the least. I requested the left wing as often as possible after that and eventually went on to work at a larger hospital. Not many strange things happen to me. I am fascinated with sleep and dreams and how each affect our minds. However, what I experienced was not a dream. I don't exactly know what it was. The story isn't filled with action or anything like that, it's just a mysterious occurrence that I don't know how to explain. I have a really bad sleep schedule. I'm usually wide awake at night and more tired during the day. It was about 1pm. I was in my bed, getting a bit drowsy. I was trying to battle falling asleep. I don't really know how to describe what happened next, but the video I was watching suddenly stopped emitting sound. I was really confused and didn't seek to do anything about it, but I did decide to get up and get some food. I was walking downstairs, got food and ate it. You may think that has no importance, but it will make sense to why this is notable. I felt myself eating and swallowing food. I then went upstairs and went to the bathroom. Again, I felt myself go to the bathroom. I felt it leaving my body. Of course, in a normal story, details like this don't matter. However, in this story, it does. I finally returned back to my bed to browse on my phone, still not emitting sound. I'm on Instagram, looking at a few posts. This will be important later on. I finally put my phone down and just start thinking about random thoughts. Nothing important. It felt like 40 to 50 minutes of just thoughts. Suddenly, like a flash, I was under my blanket... My phone continued playing with the video left off, now emitting sounds. I was almost paralyzed with fear. What just happened? I was back where I was, still 1pm, 
It still felt like an entire hour had passed, but my clock had not moved a minute. This is where me eating and going to the bathroom comes to play. I swear I ate. I swear I walked downstairs. I felt every step push against me. I felt the food being eaten and swallowed. I felt everything. I know I did. I remember going back up the stairs. I felt that. I felt myself going to the bathroom. It felt the same as when I normally do it. There was no difference. What happened? I felt the comfort of my bed. I remember myself thinking. If it was a dream, time would have passed and I wouldn't have felt anything. It wasn't a lucid dream because, again, time would have passed and... I don't think I would have felt anything. I also have never had a lucid dream in my life. I lived out an entire hour of my life that never existed. I went downstairs to see if the snack I had was still there. We only had one of those snacks I had left, so if I did actually eat it in the real world, it would be gone. I opened up the pantry and, believe it or not, the snack was still there. I didn't eat it. I felt myself eat it. How could that be possible? I felt every bite. Every time I swallowed, I felt it all. There was no way that I didn't eat that snack. Of course, I couldn't prove if I went to the bathroom or not. In that vision, I flushed, so if I did actually go to the bathroom in real life, I couldn't see it. I assumed that I didn't actually go to the bathroom in the real world and that I didn't eat in the real world. However, there was still one thing left. The post I saw on Instagram. I checked Instagram, mostly to calm my nerves. However, this just made the entire situation even more creepy. I was browsing Instagram and I recognized every single post I saw. They were all in the same order and the same post as I saw in my vision. There was no way that my brain could have made up those actual Instagram posts. No way at all. I don't know how that happened. I have no other choice but to believe that I traveled to another dimension. I actually believe that. I'm not a superstitious person or religious. Never in my life have I felt as if though I'm cursed or that other dimensions even exist. But this is the only conclusion I could come up with. You may think I was sleepwalking the entire time, but that just doesn't make sense. I have no history of sleepwalking and it was too real to be a figment of my imagination. All I'm saying, sleepwalking is ruled out. It was all too real. Of course, it wasn't a dream or a lucid dream. I have some theories on to why I think I traveled to this other dimension. The reason I felt all those things was because I actually did them somewhere else. I guess I somehow teleported. And I guess in that dimension phones don't emit noise. I went downstairs in that dimension, I ate, I went to the bathroom, I browsed Instagram and laid on my bed to think. All of that actually happened in that dimension. I still remember it happening as memories as if though they were actually real, which I guess they were real in a literal sense. I don't really know what to make of it. Why would a random video teleport me to another dimension? What's the significance of me going there? What's the point? It has no effect on my life besides the constant thinking about it. The real creepy part of this entire incident was the Instagram posts. The exact order of posting, the exact same pictures and videos I saw in my vision. There is no way my brain can make something like that up so accurately. Even if I did have a dream and somehow opened Instagram in real life and saw those posts, I wouldn't have saw it when I awoke. Once you see a post on Instagram, you won't see it again if you close out of the app or refresh. I saw the same post twice, which is basically impossible. Of course, the Instagram posts are not definitive proof that I traveled to another dimension, but it was something. I don't know what else it could be. I have no health problems, I don't do drugs, nothing was wrong with me at that moment. My mental state is fine, I'm not insane or schizophrenic, I don't know what happened. Not many strange things have happened in my life, but when they do, they're bad. Some strange things do happen, but those are stories for other times. I'll ask for answers or maybe someone to present another theory, possibly a more believable one to tell my friends and family. I'm a skeptic for all those things paranormal or alien, but this... I just can't explain it. You can't know how it felt unless it was you in my shoes. No one can.
My dad and myself used to be close, but we became distant after he left me at about the age of six at Anasta. Two years later, on my eighth birthday, the police, well, who we thought were police, showed up at my party and told us that my dad had ended his life. I was sad, and I grieved, but life moves on and so did I. Not saying I didn't miss him, because of course I did, but I had to stay strong. Anyway, I was around the age of 10 or 11 when this happened, and I was always on my PlayStation with my noise-canceling headphones. If not, on my phone with headphones on, and bear in mind, my chair was parallel to my window, which always had blinds on. Also, someone had been writing stuff, terrible names on our car windows, and I told my mom that I knew it was his handwriting, but she ignored it and said I was just being paranoid. When that wasn't enough, he scratched the car and made little dents by kicking it. Now, we ended up getting a new car after a hit and run happened, and the same happened to that car, so obviously this person was watching because we asked all of our neighbors, but their cars were fine. This day, I was on my PlayStation, but I went downstairs to get food or something, and when I came back up, before putting my headphones on, I peeped through the window, I'm quite usually a paranoid person, and saw my dad walking up and down staring at my house with his hands halfway in his pockets. That's how I knew it was him, and that's how he walked, and it looks just like him. This couldn't have just been a coincidence because he lived 120 miles away and knew no one in that area. I immediately ran downstairs and said to my mom, 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 he's outside, he's out there. My mom looked through the dining room window to see him staring at the bedroom window pacing up and down. My mom called my brother and he called my sister before opening up the door, made sure I was out of sight and shouted my dad's name and asked him what he thinks he was doing. He continued to cross the street and walk down a road where he was still visible from my window. Then my brother's sister and brother-in-law arrived and they all went out. My sister and my mom in a car and my brothers by foot. They didn't find him even after searching for a good three to four hours. Everything kind of went back to normal until I saw this woman pacing up and down staring at my house. I didn't mention this to my mom for some reason. My mom had asked me to go to the shop so I looked out the window and the woman was gone. I thought this was the end of that but when I left my house she instantly appeared and this happened time and time after where she would just appear, have this creepy smile, something out of a horror movie. One day I had left the house at around 10 a.m. and got back at around 6 to 7 p.m. She was there when I left, so I left a camera recording on my bedroom window, which showed that she had been there all day. She even sat outside my door and tried to unlock it. She even knocked on my neighbor's door and said that she was locked out and asked if she could climb over the back fence to get in. Our neighbors know us, she said no, and I started receiving a number of phone calls and when it picked up, they were just breathing. Since then, not much has happened, but I'll update if anything does. But I think my dad is stalking me, and I'm pretty sure he's paying others to do it too. I'm really bad at telling stories, but I'll try to make sense. This happened over three weeks ago. I live in downtown LA. I like to shop at Burlington that's in Broadway Street. Usually I shop in the mornings, but I decided to go in the afternoon, I'd say around maybe 4pm. I was there trying on some clothes and I see a group of guys walking my way, trying on shoes. Now I like to smile at people, you know, to show kindness. Before I got their attention I heard them speaking in Russian. I'm half Russian, half Mexican, so I understand Russia. Usually people get confused since I'm quite tan and have brown hair and gray eyes. They assume I'm either Middle Eastern or Egyptian. I like to smile at people to show kindness, so I smiled at one of the guys. We'll call him guy number one. He smiled back. I'm only 18 and I won't lie, I was quite attractive to the guy who smiled back at me. We kept staring back at each other until they left. I spent some 30 more minutes there before heading out, until the guy number one approached me and said, hey, how are you? Me being young and finding this guy attractive, I decided to make conversation with him. Also, he had a thick Russian accent right there at that moment, I decided to tell him I understand Russian. 
and speak Russian, but he spoke over me and this was out of the conversation. Guy number one says, Hey, I saw you at the store a while ago and my friends think you're very beautiful and we just wanted to talk to you. Oh, uh, hi. Yep, I noticed you three at the store while I was getting ready to try on some clothes. Yeah, <laughs> well me and my friends wanted to wait for you to tell you if you wanted to go out for some drinks. Wanna come? I didn't know either to say yes or no, so I said yes since I wanted to keep talking to this guy. I forgot to mention it was very dark outside at this point. There weren't many people out. When we walked to the guy's car, he had a black car with black tinted windows. I looked at the guys. He helped me get into the car and he sat very close to the two guys in the front. He began speaking Russian to the guy who sat next to me. I pretended not to understand what they were saying and ignored by putting my headphones in, pretending to listen to music when I heard... What exactly are we going to do to her after we drop her off somewhere? My body felt as if though my own soul left right away. I didn't understand exactly what he meant by somewhere. Then guy number three said, I think we should do what we really want to do. At this point, I wanted to cry, but I held back my tears until guy number one said, Me and my friends actually feel like going out to eat somewhere far away. I'm sure you're okay with that, yeah? I quietly responded, Um, I don't think it's a good idea. I think I'd rather just go home. Guy number one responds, You aren't going anywhere. What kind of stupid idiot would get inside a car with three guys? They all started laughing at me and I ended up crying. They drove off and the guy next to me took my phone away, throwing it outside the window. I tried kicking the windows, but he got on top of me. At that moment, I prayed to stay alive. I thought my life was over. I thought about everyone I loved. It was a terrible feeling. It makes it really hard to tell this story. Shortly after, I heard sirens behind us. It was the police. Thank God, it was two police cars, and guy number three started to panic and gave up, pulling over. They were all told to get out of the car and if anyone else was in there to come out as well. They saw me. With my hands up, I ran to the cop as they ended up getting arrested. Turns out someone from the store had recognized them from before in relation to previous petty theft and followed us to the car reporting the make and model. Thank God for their previous track record and the intelligent employee. Otherwise, I may not be alive today. To many of you, this may not seem horrifying or even close to making a mouse squeak, but when you live through a panic for two years from someone who has messed you up physically, mentally, and socially, then you'll know how truly horrifying it is when one simple friendship can become insane. It was my freshman year of college. This was my year, I had thought, to be a part of something meaningful. Clubs, sports, new fond friendships... But that's when I ended up having a class with him, Alex, also a freshman. Alex was, in the very beginning, a funny, honest, sweet guy who I found myself drawn to. Not romantically, but friendship-wise, for I was the same. We clicked instantly. Jokes were always made, and I suddenly found myself ditching classes with him, being rude to teachers, even cutting a lot of other friendships. Keep in mind, before I met him, I was never like this, but... Here's the reason why. Alex, down the line when he got comfortable, began to show his true colors. He'd fill my head up with lies about how my friends didn't like me and how they held secret talks behind my back, how they always left me out of the group and that in all reality I only had him. And that was a giant red flag, but I didn't care. I felt like he was the only one I had. Skip half the first year and he gets a lot worse with being a fake gay, always grabbing me wherever he can and pulling me away from whatever I was busy with. This had left bruises. He also began ridiculing me whenever he could. You're a bad friend, he'd always say. You don't care about anything but yourself. Cry like the baby you are. 
you mean nothing to no one. And after his vent, he'd crawl back apologizing and stupid me would accept him. But my breaking point was when he gave me a class visit. Bear with me, here's the layout of my old school. There's three wings. I was in the far right and he was in the far left. I had suddenly received a text and it had all gone like this. Look, Alex, I think we really need to spend a day for myself. Why, I thought you were my friend. Am I annoying? No, I just need to get some, some space, please. Look up. And when I did, he walked into my class, and it hit me. How he could get from one wing to the other in five minutes tops beats me, but that's when I had to break the ties. I cried and began developing a fear of Alex. I had learned his classes and which ways he'd take to avoid him. I had run to class even if there was no hurry and even though I thought it all stopped, he always found ways to contact me through his friends, through applications, anything. It's been years since all of that had happened but my mom still sees me around and I hope I never run into him again. Alex, you put a strain on my heart. I've lost close, tight-knit bonds, and what did it cost? May the next poor soul who has to deal with you do a better job than I did. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, always check your grammar. Row, row, row.